The Siberian Presents The Dream Snake by Robert E. Howard Images courtesy of Unsplash.com Audio samples courtesy of YouTube Audio Library Disclaimer The following may contain violence, horror themes, and language that may offend. Ah, uh, research notes. Aldrich Devonshire Estate, 1925. The night was strangely still as we sat upon the wide veranda, gazing out over the broad, shadowy lawns. The silence of the hour entered our spirits, and for a long while, no one spoke. Then, far across the dim mountains that fringed the eastern skyline, a faint haze began to glow, and presently a great golden moon came up, making a ghostly radiance over the land, and etching boldly the dark clumps of shadows that were trees. A light breeze came whispering out of the east, and the unmowed grass swayed before it, in long, sinuous waves. Dimly visible in the moonlight, and from among the group upon the veranda, there came a swift gasp, a sharp intake of breath that caused us all to turn and gaze. <clears throat> Fanning was leaning forward, clutching the arms of his chair, his face strange and pallid in the spectral light, a thin trickle of blood seeping from the lip in which he had set his teeth. Amazed, we looked at him. And suddenly, he jerked about with a short, snarling laugh. There's no need of gawking at me like a flock of sheep, he said irritably, and stopped short. We sat bewildered, scarcely knowing what sort of reply to make. And suddenly, he burst out again. Now, I guess I'd better tell the whole thing. Or you'll be going off and putting me down as a lunatic. Don't interrupt me, any of you. I want to get this thing of my mind. You all know that I am not a very imaginative man, but there is a thing, purely a figment of imagination, that has haunted me since babyhood. A dream. He fairly cringed back in his chair as he muttered, A dream. And God, what a dream. The first time... No. No, I can't remember the first time I ever dreamed it. I've been dreaming the hellish thing ever since I can remember. Now, it's this way. There's a sort of bungalow set upon a hill in the midst of wide grassland, not unlike this estate. But this scene is in Africa, and I'm living there with a sort of servant, a Hindu. Just why I'm there is never clear in my waking mind, though I am always aware of the reason in my dreams. As a man of a dream, I remember my past life, a life which in no way corresponds with my waking life. But when I am awake, my subconscious mind fails to transmit these impressions. However, I think that I am a fugitive from justice, and the Hindu is also a fugitive. How the bungalow came to be there, I can never remember. Nor do I know what part of Africa it is. Though all these things are known to my dream self. But the bungalow is a small one, of very few rooms, and is situated upon the top of a hill, as I said. There are no other hills about, and the grasslands stretch to the horizon in every direction. Knee high in some places, waist high in others. Now, the dream always opens as I'm coming up the hill, just as the sun is beginning to set. I'm carrying a broken rifle, and I've been on a hunting trip. How the rifle was broken and the full details of the trip, I clearly remember dreaming, but never upon waking. It is just as if a curtain was suddenly raised and the drama began, or just as if I was suddenly transferred to another man's body and life, remembering past years of that life and not cognizant of any other existence. 
and that is the hellish part of it, as you know. Most of us dreaming are, at the back of our consciousness, aware that we are dreaming. No matter how horrible the dream may become, we know that it is a dream. And thus, insanity or possible death is staved off. But in this particular dream, there is no such knowledge. I tell you it is so vivid, so complete in every detail, that I wonder sometimes if that is not my real existence, and this a dream. But no, for then I should have been dead years ago. Uh, as I was saying, I come up the hill, and the first thing I am cognizant of, that is out of the ordinary, is a sort of track leading up the hill in an irregular way. That is, the grass is mashed down, as if something heavy had been dragged over it. But I pay no special attention to it, for I am thinking, with some irritation, that the broken rifle I carry is my only arm, and that now I must forego hunting until I can send for another. You see, I remember thoughts and impressions of the dream itself, of the occurrences of the dream. It is the memories that the dream I has of that other dream existence that I cannot remember. So I come up the hill and enter the bungalow. The doors are open and the Hindu is not there. But the main room is in confusion. Chairs are broken, a table overturned. The Hindu's dagger is lying upon the floor. But there is no blood anywhere. Now, in my dreams, I never remember the other dreams, as sometimes one does. Always it is the first dream, the first time. I always experience the same sensations in my dreams, with as vivid a force as the first time I ever dreamed. So I am not able to understand this. The Hindu is gone, but thus I ruminate standing in the centre of the disordered room. What did away with him? Had it been a raiding party of Negroes, they would have looted the bungalow and probably burnt it. Had it been a lion, the place would have been smeared with blood. Then suddenly, I remember the track I saw going up the hill, and a cold hand touches my spine. For instantly, the whole thing is clear. The thing that came up from the grassland and wrought havoc in the little bungalow could be naught else except a giant serpent. And as I think of the size of the spoor, cold sweat beads my forehead, and the broken rifle shakes in my hand. Then I rush to the door in a wild panic. My only thought is to make a dash for the coast. But the sun has set and dusk is stealing across the grassland. And out there, somewhere, lurking in the tall grass, is that grisly thing, that horror. God! <clears throat> the ejaculation broke from his lips with such feeling that all of us started, not realizing the tension we had reached. There was a second silence. Then he continued. So I built the doors and windows. Like the lamp I have, and take my stand in the middle of the room. And I stand like a statue, waiting, listening. After a while, the moon comes up, and a haggard light drifts through the windows, and I stand still in the center of the room. The night is very still, something like this night. The breeze occasionally whispers through the grass, and each time I start, I clench my hands until the nails bite into the flesh and blood trickles down my wrists. And I stand there and wait and listen, but it does not come that night. The sentence came suddenly and explosively, and an involuntary sigh came from the rest, a relaxing attention. I am determined if I live the night through, to start for the coast early the next morning. 
taking my chance out there in the grim grasslands with it. But with morning, I dare not. I do not know in which direction the monster went, and I dare not risk coming upon him in the open, unarmed as I am. So, as in a maze, I remained at the bungalow, and ever my eyes turned towards the sun, lurching restlessly down the sky toward the horizon. Ah, God, if I could but halt the sun in the sky. The man was in a clutch of some terrific power. His words fairly leapt at him. Then the sun rocks down the sky, and the long grey shadows come stalking across the grassland. Dizzy with fear, I have bolted the doors and windows and lighted the lamp long before the last faint glow of twilight fades. The light from the windows may attract the monster, but I dare not stay in the dark. And again I take my stand in the centre of the room, waiting. There was a shuddersome halt. Then he continued, barely above a whisper, moistening his lips. There is no knowing how long I stand there. Time has ceased to be, and each second is an eon. Each minute is an eternity, stretching into endless eternities. Then, God, but what is that? He leaned forward, moonlight etching his face into such a mask of horrified listening that each of us shivered and flung a hasty glance over our shoulders. Not the night breeze this time, he whispers. Something makes the grasses swish, swish, as if great, long, pliant weight were being dragged through them. Above the bungalow it swishes and then ceases. In front of the door, then the hinges creak, creak. The door begins to bulge inward. A small bit and then some more. The man's arms were held in front of him as if bracing strongly against something and his breath came in quick gasps. And I knew I should lean against the door and hold it shut. But I do not. I cannot move. I stand there like a sheep waiting to be slaughtered. But the door holds. Again that sigh, expressive of pent-up feeling. He drew a shaky hand across his brow. And all night I stand in the center of that room as motionless as an image, except to turn slowly as the swish, swish of the grass marks the fiend's course about the house. Ever I keep my eyes in the direction of that soft, sinister sound. Sometimes it ceases for an instant, or for several minutes, and then I stand, scarcely breathing, for a horrible obsession has it that the serpent has in some way made entrance into the bungalow. And I started well, this way and that, frightfully fearful of making a noise, though I know not why, but ever with the feeling that the thing is at my back. Then the sounds commence again, and I freeze, motionless. Now here is the only time that my consciousness, which guides my waking hours, ever in any way pierces the veil of dreams. I am in the dream, in no way conscious that it is a dream, but in a detached sort of way my other mind recognizes certain facts and passes them on to my sleeping, shall I say, ego. That is to say, my personality is for an instant truly dual and separate to an extent as the right and left arms are separate, whilst making up parts in the same entity. My dreaming mind has no cognizance of my higher mind, but for the time being, the other mind is subordinate, and the subconscious mind is in full control, to an extent that it does not even recognize the existence of the other. But the conscious mind, now sleeping, is cognizant of dim thought waves emanating from the dream mind. I know I have not made this entirely clear, but the fact remains 
that I know that my mind, conscious and subconscious, is near to ruin. My obsession with fear, as I stand there in my dream, is that the serpent will raise itself and peer into the window at me. And I know in my dream that if this occurs, I shall go insane. And so vivid is the impression imparted to my conscious, now sleeping mind, that the thought waves stir the dim seas of sleep. And somehow I can feel my sanity rocking as my sanity rocks in my dream. Back and forth, it totters and sways until the motion takes on a physical aspect. And in my dream, I am swaying from side to side. Not always is the sensation the same, but I tell you, if that horror ever raises its terrible shape and leers at me, if I ever see the fearful thing in my dream, I should become stark, wild, insane. There was a restless movement among the rest. <laughs> God, but what a prospect, he muttered, to be insane and forever dreaming that same dream, night and day. But there I stand, and centuries go by. But at last, a dim grey light begins to steal through the windows. The swishing dies away in the distance, and presently a red, haggard sun climbs the eastern sky. Then I turn about and gaze into a mirror, and my hair has become perfectly white. I stagger to the door and fling it wide. There is nothing in sight but a wide track leading away down the hill through the grassland. In the opposite direction from that which I would take to the coast. And with a shriek of maniacal laughter, I dash down the hill and race across the grassland. I race until I drop from exhaustion. And then I lie until I can stagger up and go on. All day I kept this up, with superhuman effort, spurned on by the horror behind me. And ever as I hurl myself forward on weakening legs, ever as I lie gasping for breath, I watch the sun with terrible eagerness. How swiftly the sun travels when a man races it for life. A losing race it is as I know when I watch the sun sinking towards the skyline, and the hills which I had hoped to gain ere sundown, seemingly as far away as ever. His voice was lowered, and instinctively we leaned toward him. He was gripping the chair arms, and blood was seeping from his lip. Then the sun sets, and the shadows come, and I stagger on, and fall, and rise, and reel on again, <laughs> and I laugh. Laugh, laugh. <laughs> then I cease, for the moon comes up and throws the grasslands in ghostly and silvery relief. The light is white across the land, though the moon itself is like blood. And I look back the way I have come, and far back. All of us leaned further toward him, our hair a prickle. His voice came like a ghostly whisper. Far back, I see the grass waving. There is no breeze, but the tall grass parts and sways in the moonlight, in a narrow, sinuous line, far away, but nearing every instant. His voice died away. Someone broke the ensuing stillness. And then? Then I awake. Never. Yet have I seen the foul monster, but that is the dream that haunts me, and from which I have wakened in my childhood, screaming in my manhood in cold sweat. At irregular intervals I dream it, and each time lately he hesitated, and then went on. Each time lately the thing has been getting closer, closer. The waving of the grass marks his progress, and he nears me with each dream. And when he reaches me, then... 
he stopped short, then without a word rose abruptly and entered the house. The rest of us sat silent for a while, then followed him, for it was late. How long I slept I do not know, but I woke suddenly with the impression that somewhere in the house someone had laughed, long, loud, and hideous, as a maniac laughs. Starting up, wondering if I had been dreaming, I rushed from my room, just as a truly horrible shriek echoed through the house. The place was now alive with other people who had been awakened, and all of us rushed to Faming's room whence the sounds had seemed to come. Faming lay dead upon the floor, where it seemed he had fallen in some terrific struggle. There was no mark upon him, but his face was terribly distorted, as the face of a man who has been crushed by some superhuman force, such as some gigantic snake. Thank you for listening. This has been a Siberian production of Robert E. Howard's The Dream Snake. For updates, follow Vin Studios on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Images courtesy of Unsplash.com. Audio samples courtesy of YouTube Audio Library. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell of the Siberian YouTube channel. And if you're feeling generous, buy us a coffee to support our work. All links in the description. <laughs>